Hey everyone, welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com. It's rainy here and it is rainy in market land as well. The S&P chopping around. Yesterday, all about the distribution recovering or, or I guess evolving from Wednesday's uh, from Wednesday's rally after the Powell press conference. Today, sort of chopping around the NASDAQ, giving up further to the downside. We'll talk about some of those key levels for the S&P, the major averages as energy Spikes higher. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. It's Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com here in rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques to make sense of these markets. I've quoted Jesse Livermore a lot of times recently. There's time to go long, time to go short, and time to go fishing. And if you have that option this week, probably a decent week to take a step back and just sort of let things play out. I've talked with a lot of investors in this sort of environment, particularly Fed week, when you've got a lot of uh, potential catalyst, heavy earnings. And while you can certainly try to game the earnings reports and try to anticipate who's going to uh, outperform or underperform based on where they come out relative to expectations, it is an uncertain time. You have charts like build.com gapping to the downside, Under Armour and others, Dish, uh, you know, moving downward very quickly. Uh, and uh, and that's sort of the environment that we're uh, that we're in. On the other side, you have energy names that are ripping to the upside. So that is the nature of equity investing of of charting stocks is you have to be prepared for those sudden movements. But at the end of the day, there's hope, right? I mean, the the, the benefit of looking longer term uh, cannot be uh, overstated. And we think about some of my guests this week, talking with Katie Stockton, talking with Christopher Mullen yesterday. We're thinking more about the big picture, Jeff Weiss on Tuesday, long-term trend lines and thinking about the overall evolution of these markets. Uh, today here, we will wrap this week and focus on how the trends have changed from last Friday to this Friday. Really good guests for you this week. We have great guests for you next week as well. On Tuesday the 10th, Larry Berman, uh, who I, uh, I served with on the board of directors of the Market Technicians Association of the CMT Association. Uh, he'll be joining us on the show on Tuesday from ETF Capital Management in Toronto. John Gagliardi from Fidelity Investments is going to join us on Wednesday, the 11th. And on Thursday, the 12th, Matt Maley, founder of the Maley Report and uh, from Miller Tabak in Boston, is going to share us his thoughts. Let's uh, wrap this week and focus on a very challenging week for a lot of investors. I know there's a lot of uncertainty. One of my gauges is when my parents, shout out to uh, Rick and Joe Keller in Cleveland, Ohio, when they asked me about the market environment, I know that it's bubbled up to enough to where they are, uh, they are very focused on it as well. Good indication of, uh, of when things are happening, and I got the call earlier today. Before we wrap the, wrap the week, though, let's talk about a poll. We have a poll going at all times on our live stream page at stockcharts.com, also on our social media accounts, so give us a follow on Twitter. And check out our YouTube channel and subscribe to that if you could. We asked you recently, how important are seasonal cycles in your analytical process? Very important, somewhat important, not very. Or what's a seasonal cycle? The good news, only 4% of you said you had no idea what I was talking about. And that's pretty good. Uh, for those 4%, I would encourage you to look for our chart school section on seasonality on market cycles, because I think there's something to be gained from that. Uh, the most uh, common answer was 55% uh, saying somewhat important. That's about where I would think of it too. I, I know a lot of investors that rely heavily on cycles. Um, you know, talking with um, uh, Jeff Hurst from Stock Traders Almanac is an example. Uh, the Almanac investor does a great job continuing his father's work, Yale Hurst, who really was a pioneer of a lot of the seasonal trends and tendencies that we kind of take for granted now. Uh, he really pioneered a lot of that work and popularized it in the investment community. And talking with Jeff, even him, uh, you know, he focuses a lot on cyclicality and cyclical movements in stocks, but also focuses on trends. And that's where he's really been able to, I think, elevate that, uh, that thinking about, uh, about seasonal trends. The reason why I wanted to ask that question now is we are right at the beginning of the month of May. And as you may have heard, sell in May and go away is a common uh, market maxim. 
Here's the thing, though. The market tends to be pretty good January through April, and April actually tends to be one of the stronger months. We had a pretty pretty rough April uh, after a pretty rough first quarter. So this might be one of those years where sell in May uh, maybe is perhaps a not a good uh, a good one, only because we've already sold off so much, which is a little a little unusual uh, if you look at the average returns of the year. But a lot to be a lot to be said. And I would say I, I would encourage you to at least explore seasonal trends. It can be an interesting overlay to the work on trend and momentum that we talk about on this show. Let's continue to wrap the week, just briefly touching in on what happened today. It was a choppy day for the most part. The S&P about half a percent lower than yesterday, uh, finishing the day right back above 4,100, but sort of teased that level through the course of the trading day. The Nasdaq leading the way downwards, uh, losing 1.4%. This is one of those interesting days where the markets were down, but the VIX was actually down as well. Friendly reminder, the VIX is not just the S&P plotted upside down. It's based on the volatility in the options market, so it can be disconnected. In general, it tends to be an inverse relationship from, uh, from stock markets, but not, not all the time. And this is one of those times. Again, a VIX above 30 tells you the market, uh, the, the volatility is essentially elevated. Interest rates push higher uh, for the most part today, finish at the upper end with the 10-year yield above 3.1%. 30-year yields above 3.2%. These are levels we haven't seen since the end of 2018. So these are pretty uh, pretty significant moves that we're seeing uh, after the uh, the Fed meeting this week. Commodities essentially choppy. There's not a lot to talk about there, although oil prices certainly moved higher. And then cryptocurrency is a mixed bag, but for the most most point uh, for the most part, uh, Bitcoin and Ether prices uh, lower uh, after really struggling yesterday in sort of that overall risk off movement. Let's look at the wrap the week chart here very briefly. Where am I looking? Here we go, wrap the week chart. So here we're looking at the close from last Friday and looking at how these major asset classes have evolved using ETFs from last Friday's close to this Friday's close. Follow my mouse and, and my voice. I'll point you through what this is telling us. The black line here right around zero is the S&P. So think about that. With all the movement that we saw this week, the quiet period, the calm before the storm Monday, Tuesday, the big sudden rally on Wednesday where it felt like the S&P was going to go to 5,000 in the next 10 minutes, pushed the S&P about 4% uh, for the week, gave back all of that on uh, Thursday and then a little bit more today. But, but at the end of the day, all that volatility got us nowhere. We we're right where we were five days ago on the S&P 500. Hard to believe given the severity of the days that we've seen some huge percentage swings, five plus percent you know, on the way up, on the way down. And in the end, it's a, it's an unch, it's an unchange for the week. So it tells you where the directional trend is. And, and Grant, I think some of my guests this week did such a great job of, of sort of articulating that long-term time frame. The way you make sense of a market in this sort of environment is focus on the long-term catalyst and remember that the short-term movements happen within that long-term trend. Now, a couple of things outperformed the S&P this week, but not many. Most things were down today. The only two things in our group of ETFs were the dollar index, which is up about half a percent using the UUP. And then in brown, we have crude oil prices, which finished up about six and a half percent using the USO ETF. Everything else was down for the week. Gold down 0.8 percent. Small caps, and um, this is uh, uh, small caps in the NASDAQ 100 here, clustered right around 1.3 percent down. In orange, we have emerging markets down 3.4 percent. In red, bond prices down 4.7 percent. We mentioned interest rates pushing higher into the end of the uh, end of the week here and bond prices coming off. Then the worst performer for the week, Bitcoin, down uh, almost 7% from last Friday's close to where we're at today. Just quickly looking elsewhere at some of the themes today, you know, this is all about energy and defensives. And uh, we've talked, I feel, I feel like we've, it's a broken record of sorts talking about where the opportunities have been. It's energy stocks. And when I'm looking at charts like DVN or Oxy, these are stocks literally making new all-time highs at a time when the market is flat for the week and a lot of individual names, particularly growthy names, are struggling to hold up. Healthcare names like DXEM are gapping lower or breaking lower and losing you know, 7% uh, at a clip. There are stocks that are working just fine and they're in, uh, in certain sectors. So energy actually up almost 3% today. Utilities up 0.8%. Consumer staples flat for the day, but a number of charts in that sector we've highlighted uh, in recent uh, weeks and months. Uh, really emerging, particularly on a relative basis. And I think that's where the story of consumer staples is, uh, is most meaningful. Um, at the bottom of the list, we have communication services, consumer discretionary, both uh, part of the bottom three. Materials is an interesting one because uh, at, at times energy and materials have actually moved together, sort of traditional late cycle leadership, but materials are actually coming off today 1.4% uh, to the downside. But in general, this is a, sort of a value overgrowth 
defense over offense type of feel to the uh, to the tape today. And those are not new themes. These are things we've talked about, I feel like, for uh, for quite some time. Look at the top ranked names out of our entire large cap universe uh, in the U.S. You can see many of these are in the energy space. Accidental, Valero, DVN, Marathon Oil reported earnings. Petrobras is a, um, a Brazilian uh, energy company, EQT. Uh, which is a uh, a 15 billion market cap name uh, in the uh, at the top of the list right here. So it's it's sort of all energy in the in the top ranked names using our proprietary scooter ranking uh, system. Let's finish off uh, our wrap the week segment looking at the mindful investor live chart. Let's as a reminder, this is a list of charts that I keep updated on the stock charts platform. To access this list, by the way, go to the articles tab. Go to my page, which is called the Mindful Investor. You'll see a gray button at the top, and you can access this list of charts. I'll keep them updated uh, at least once a week. I'll go in and refresh all these charts and make sure they're reflecting where we're at. So we have to start with a weekly uh, market trend model uh, for me, and we we became we came really really close. And I almost thought we were going to re register sell, sell signal. It didn't quite get there, and I, I I've agreed. I, I I promised myself years ago I would only update this chart every Friday at the close. So if it didn't ha happen by Friday's close, you have to wait till the next week. So by definition, the long-term model is really close to uh, turning negative, but not quite uh, today. But you know, obviously the medium-term and short-term models have now been negative for four weeks each. The medium-term model in particular is my main gauge of risk on or risk off, looking out about a month, uh, one to three months on average. Uh, and so these are uh, both of those are suggesting that, that obviously there's a plenty of weakness in the short and medium term, the long term model very close to uh, signaling uh, a bearish signal. It's only been bearish a handful of times, maybe five or six individual times since the 2009 market low. Getting below there would certainly be an indication of, uh, you know, putting this in a rel relatively small group of observations of, uh, of, of very much, you know, basically cyclical pullbacks within the secular bull market that we've been in for quite some time. You know, I always joked uh, with uh, the manager of our chart room at Fidelity, uh, where we had a lot of paper charts. We we more and more incorporated digital signage and screens into uh, into the chart room, but it was a lot of paper charts. Anytime we had to reprint the chart because it had gone off the scale, right? We went to a new high or a new low, and you had to actually re, um, you know, calibrate the y-axis. That was a signal. So when we saw people going in there with new pieces of paper is like, hold on, what moved so much that we had to reprint the whole chart? The S&P is kind of there, right? If you look at the last one year, we're at the lower end of that range. Now, what's interesting is we've been testing support around 4,100. That's the level we first reached in February. We've now tested that a number of times here in the last a week or so. We didn't close below 4,100. We've not done that yet, uh, but I would argue a close below the previous lows certainly clears the way to potential further uh, downside uh, going uh, going forward. One last chart I wanted to get to, breadth overall has remained fairly negative. Um, and I think I want to leave it here. This is the percent of stocks above their 200 day moving average, which remained below 50 for the last month. And again, as long as it remains below 50%, tells you well, overall uh, conditions are, are fairly negative because most stocks are in a downturn. They're below their 200 day. Uh, about 30% of the S&P above their 50 day. Then neither of those are updated for today's close, by the way. So most likely both of those would pop down a little bit given the deterioration we saw uh, today in the equity market. So overall, these are breadth conditions that you know are at the lower end of the range if you think about the, the, the tactical movements. However, they also are very characteristic of the beginning of a much deeper, much more painful correction. That's the danger that I would foresee going into next week. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. What if you could look beyond price? and identify big moves in the market before they happen. That's why we created the Moxie Indicator Minutes. Hosted by me, T.G. Watkins of Simpler Trading, the creator of the Moxie Indicator. Each week, I'll provide you details about the indicator, what it does, and how it can work for you. Only on Stock Charts TV. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. We had a lot of great conversations this week with some top strategists, technically oriented investors. More to come uh, next week. I want to get to uh, uh, our, our uh, power up segment here in a few moments. But before we do so, a couple of quick announcements. First off, we'll do a mailbag segment here in a few minutes. And we'd love to feature one of your questions in our next mailbag segment Tuesday of next week. You can get your questions to us one of three ways via email 
the final bar at stockcharts.com via Twitter at final bar SCTV via YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our stock charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Tuesday's show next week. Also, go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on demand platform. We put a lot of great content through our YouTube channel. We put an exceptional amount of fantastic content through our on demand platform. It is available on the web at stockchartstv.com. But if you want to see free interviews and market strategists sharing their outlook in uncertain times, uh, go to Stockcharts TV on demand on your mobile device on any of the app stores. Let's continue on today's show with our next segment, Power Up. We are always upgrading the Stock Charts platform this year in particular, 2022 uh, has been so far a year of some pretty nice upgrades to our platform. We have a lot of incredibly powerful stuff lining up for you. Our developers are working overtime to get these things ready for you. Um, so look for really, uh, really good announcements. By the way, stockcharts.com slash new is the way to see all the newest functionality that we've had. One of the things I wanted to highlight today it's something we've had for quite some time, but I think it's one of the more powerful parts of our platform. And the reason why I'm telling you is because one of my alerts was tell me when plug power, which is in the renewable energy uh, equipment space, tell me when plug power gets below $20. Because I saw that as a potential area of support. I actually had a position in plug power. I have since closed it. And I had set this alert to tell me when it broke through, you know, what I perceived as being a key uh, support level. Earlier this morning, 9.37 a.m., my cell phone lighted up, uh, lit up, excuse me, with a text from stockcharts.com telling me, hey, your alert was triggered. And here's where you can get more information about it. When I logged into Stock Charts, the alert panel was at the top of my screen. It's such a really good feature. And it is a way to help have Stock Charts actually help you stay on top of some key things that you want to do. The way that you use our alert platform, by the way, is if you uh, go to Charts and Tools at the top of the website, click on uh, your alerts in the right column where it has a bunch of really cool uh, functions. This is where you can set your alerts. Anything you've already created, is gonna be on this list. So you can see I have a set of alerts looking for stocks making new highs and lows, something I uh, refer to very often, and also any individual names that I put. I keep this pretty tight, so I clean these up pretty regularly, but I know people that have hundreds of these tracking individual uh, movements. If you wanna create a new alert, you go to the technical alert workbench. The basic one is called the price alert. This is just saying, tell me when Apple gets a uh, crosses above a particular price level, it automatically comes in with the current level. And you could say, all right, I'm, you know, I think Apple could be interesting above 170. And you can decide how you want to be updated and make sure we have the right contact information. We will email you, text you, and uh, pop a headline up, whatever at the top of your, uh, your uh, login, whatever you think would be, uh, would be most helpful. If you want to do anything crazier than that, go to advanced alert. This is where you can actually use a simple programming language to, uh, to set your alerts. If you're not a developer, which I am certainly not, use the alert components at the bottom. You can take some of our predefined alerts that we're automatically running all the time, or you can take common candle patterns, point and figure patterns, any of our technical indicator library. Uh, you can program that in here. You can also filter it by a particular index members or sectors or industries, pop them in here. And then again, let stock charts do some of the work for you and help you find those charts that are actionable by setting alerts ahead of time. It's a great way to, uh, to leverage our platform as a, uh, as a power user. Let's continue on with our next segment, the final bar mailbag. As a reminder, our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. Here's some of the questions we've gotten in the last couple of days. Here's question number one. Can chart patterns be years, even decades apart? For example, VERU um, and uh, PVH were two examples you shared with me. It made a double top, but it was 30 years apart. Point, uh, PVH, weekly or monthly, as it made head and shoulders patterns. Uh, and you send me this link, you send me the link of PVH. So I'm going to bring that one, uh, that one up here. Now, this is a long-term chart. This is a monthly chart going back to uh, early 2000s. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of data that we're bringing in here. And your question is, is this a valid head and shoulders pattern, uh, even though it's on a longer term time frame? So here's the thing. My, my answer is yes and no. Um, you know, yes. Could you look, find patterns on longer time frames? Absolutely. If you read the classic texts on this, Edwards and McGee, which is you know, some refer to as the Bible of technical analysis. This was uh, written by uh, Edwards and, uh, and, uh, and, and John McGee. I forget Edwards' first name, Ralph Edwards. I, forget, I should know that. Uh, but, uh, but basically, they wrote one of the first books written on technical analysis that was widely popularized and uh, mid 20th century. And they talked about some of these different ways to analyze price patterns and, the, and the, the, the information that was embedded in those patterns. There's sort of a sweet spot for the time frame that certain patterns emerge. So head and shoulders patterns and triangle patterns, they talk about the time frames that usually happen. 
wasn't a multi-year, you know, six to 10 year uh, pattern, which is what you're showing here. Here's a problem I have with this particular example. Is this a head and shoulders pattern? I don't think so. This is sort of a wishful thinking head and shoulders, uh, which is something I just made up. This is sort of a mishmash of things. A head and shoulders pattern is usually a very clear cut pattern with a high surrounded by two lower highs. So if you really wanted to find a valid uh, um, head and shoulders pattern, I apologize, I'm, just, I'm absolutely butchering your chart here, but I hope you'll forgive me. So what I would say is, you know, is this a head? Yes. Is this a left shoulder? Yep. Is that a right shoulder? Is this the um, neckline between the two of them? So you take the low here and the low there. Did we break it? Absolutely. You take the height of that pattern, you subtract it from the breakdown that gives us an objective right about there. Not a bad take on this chart. That would make sense. And I would argue the weekly chart is probably going to give you a better illustration of that particular time frame. What you were showing doesn't really look like a head and shoulders. It's like a, a couple heads and a bunch of shoulders is, which is not a really good valid pattern. What you have to remember with price patterns is there are very specific rules that Edwards and McGee and Murphy and Pring and others have, have demonstrated have added value over time. And others, if you read some of the other books on price patterns, uh, Tom Bukowski wrote a, a book on chart patterns, really back testing them. And I, there are issues with that, but I, I think overall, it's, it, I like the fact that it helps you think about success rates and how to actually play these. I would remind you that any sort of price pattern like this, they don't happen in a, in a vacuum. And I would encourage you to use uh, other uh, indicators and other price analysis to validate the patterns that you see. The other problem with this is a head and shoulders. You'd have to break the neckline, which would be all the way down there to actually confirm that pattern, which is obviously impossible. Next question, and thank you for that last one. Assuming the Fed increases the rate by 50, points, uh, 50 basis points all the way this year, then the heavily leveraged in investors and institutions have to sell, and no sector could be immune to such a downfall due to liquidation and margin calls. What are the similarities of the current market with previous periods in history, such as 08, 18, or 20? How far could we be from a constructive turn in the market? Could this be the beginning of a secular bear market? In one long question, you have asked all questions that I think me and many other strategists are trying to answer. And, and, the, and the answer is it's, uh, you know, it, it, I think that's an open question. Even my peers in the industry were debating and arguing um, some of these points. You know, certain things that seem very consistent from the technically uh, oriented experts to, of which I, I follow very closely uh, is the fact that the market is clearly in distribution phase, particularly the growth oriented parts of the market. If you are buying growth stocks here, or if you're recommending to buy growth stocks here, you are assuming that the main reason is because they've gone down a lot. And I've never treated that as a great reason to buy anything, right? You want to, uh, you want to look for indications, some catalysts that would suggest to you that those stocks are most likely going to go higher. And strategists that I work with, when I'm asked about uh, the Fed, uh, you have to remember they are, they are basically making it very clear what they are planning to do. We knew this last year that the Fed would be uh, you know, changing, having a much more hawkish tone. They'd be raising rates. They would be uh, lightening up or not eliminating um, the, uh, the, the, the bond buying spree that they've been on in recent years. All of that is actually happening. And not surprisingly, value-oriented parts of the market are doing pretty well and growth-oriented parts of the market are struggling. Having said that, how similar are we to previous, uh, previous events? I would encourage you to go back to my interview with Tony Dwyer, which was not this week, but it was the week before. Go to stockchartstv.com or on our YouTube channel. My conversation with Tony was really good. He compared 2022 to 1995, which is an interesting historical parallel. I had a lot of fun talking to him about just given this conditions of uh, you know, what the Fed is trying to do, the inflationary pressures and where we're at in the bull market cycle. I, you know, thus, I would say is, uh, is tell you that. How far are we from a constructive turn in the market? That's the real question here. And again, I, the, the, the toolkits I would use to make that assessment are price, breadth, and sentiment. None of those yet are telling me that we're at a bottoming point. We're not seeing capitulation in price. We're not seeing um, you know, breadth conditions improve, any sort of bullish divergence that would tell you that it's not as bad as the price is telling you. And the sentiment's bombed out, which is what it was in those previous uh, you know, bear cycles that you talk about, particularly 08. The sentiment right now looks a lot like 08, 09, and before the real uh, pain started. Um, so that would be my long-winded answer to your question. Next question, why does there tend to be a rush of institutional investors buying just before the close? Why wait until the last hour? That's a really good question. I mentioned that a number of times. I, I talk about the last 30 to 60 minutes, how it tends to be a lot of institutions. And, and here's the reality. For my time as an institutional investor working at a larger money management firm, you're managing so many assets. So at the time, we managed just over $2 trillion in active money. And uh, now it's, it's, it's much higher at the firm I was at. 
Uh, but in equities, it was just under a, a billion dollars that we managed. And so you have funds that are managing large amounts. So if you go to add to a position in Disney or lighten up, just lighten up a position in Intel, you have the chance to severely shock the market because you have to unload so many shares because if you're managing $50 billion in a mutual fund, a small position is like a, you know, a $500 million position. And so you need to really, you know, you're really going to make some changes to the market very quickly. So a lot of time and effort by the trading desk was done to try to minimize the impact. So you spread trades over days, if not weeks, to try to minimize the impact. And one of the things you do besides using dark pools and using ways that are less transparent because you don't want to advertise, here's what we're doing and here's why, you want to try to be able to act on your expertise and not have your action affect the market as much as possible. Um, so you'd also do is wait till the end of the day. And that means there's limited time for investors to react necessarily to what you're doing. So a lot of institutions will wait until the end of the day. That's when you make your, your big trades because there's limited um, uh, opportunity for people to take any severe action afterwards. You kind of wrap up and you can put in a lot of volume and sort of uh, get things done. So you look at the volume during the day, it's a ton right at the open, a ton right near the close, and that's uh, pretty much why. Finally, can you compare and contrast your scooter SCTR versus the IBD composite rating? I had some really good um, interaction with the people over at uh, Investors Business Daily. And you know, often when I'm asked about a book to recommend, I talk about, um, besides John Murphy and other books that many of us talk about for technical analysis, is a non-technical book I would mention. It's uh, William O'Neill's How to Make Money in Stocks. It really talks about marrying technical analysis with fundamental analysis, looking for leading stocks with leading charts, right? Looking for leading growth orientation, earnings growth, and the ability that the opportunity to grow earnings over time with relative strength, which tells you that the price is actually going higher. And I think that's a brilliant way of showing how some really knowledgeable and in, in, institutional investors try to uh, try to do that. So what are the differences? The scooter ranking is based purely on trend and momentum. So there's nothing fundamental. There's nothing outside of that. Things like the IBD composite rating, uh, Mark Chaikin's composite rating, or uh, the power gauge rating that they use uh, have a fundamental and a technical component. So trying to mar marrying those disciplines in a meaningful way. So ours is based purely on trend. I would encourage you, if you're using our scooter rankings as an investment tool, as an input in your process, which I certainly do, you need to understand what these companies are doing and have part of your process understanding the growth or value orientation of these names and make sure the chart is telling you what you need about companies that you're uh, looking to invest in. Really thoughtful questions. Thank you guys so much. We need to wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts. In just under three minutes, here we go. Chart number one is my market trend model. Every Friday, we refer to this chart very briefly. I had this in here just in case we triggered a sell signal. It didn't quite do it. However, the last four weeks have been a bearish signal from my medium-term model and a bearish signal from my short-term model. Those are the main things, particularly the medium-term model is the main way that I try to make sense of what this market is in terms of my risk assessment and my more uh, you know, trying to take on additional risk or lighten up the risk that I would have in a portfolio if I'm investing in this particular environment. The fact that the, uh, the, the signal turned negative four weeks ago and has remained negative, to be honest, save a couple of weeks, it's been negative all of 2022. It tells me that um, I should be thinking much more about managing risk than managing opportunity, think more about risk off versus risk on. And I think nothing I saw this week would suggest that a change in that uh, is, a, uh, is a good move at the moment. Chart number two is an example of the types of names that can move. I forget, I've quoted this person and I forget who it was. It was either GAN or um, some GAN-like strategist. I want to say it was either GAN or like Wells Wilder or one of those that talked, I think it was GAN's book on commodities where he talked about why I don't trade stocks. And one of the things was because of the company risk. Companies can announce earnings, they can have a management change, they can have buyouts, M&A activity, and all of a sudden the price changes dramatically. Under Armour was worth $14 a share yesterday, and now we're told it's worth about $11. Uh, the fundamental or the, the, the theory of uh, efficient markets would tell you that is just instantly priced into the market. I would tell you there's a lot of fear and a lot of greed, probably more fear than anything reflected on a lot of individual stock charts. That is the danger of investing in stocks and an important reason why you want to manage your risk. Finally. We talk a lot about the S&P and then the NASDAQ on the show. And, and when I'm looking at whether or not the market is okay, I'm also seeing the mid cap, the uh, small cap, and the micro cap indexes all making new lows for the year this week. This is a market in distribution, folks. Thank you so much for joining us every day this week. All of our previous episodes on StockChartsTV.com. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.